We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His help, His protection, His mercy, His blessings, His sustenance and praying and begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst the most successful individuals both in this life and the hereafter. Ameen Ya Rabbal Alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Qur'an wherein He subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahidah. That, and this is addressing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he says that this ummah of yours, this community of yours is a single community. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us as people of the ummah to remain united. Now of course there's various different definitions of what united can be. But if we go back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and I find that the American Muslim experience is generally very close to that of the times of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the reason behind that is because in the gatherings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there were people of all different backgrounds within that one gathering. Of course, where people, to, immigrants into this country come from when you go to different lands, you generally find a people of a certain ideology, a certain specific mindset that all attend the same kind of masjid or community center, or a prayer area, or whatever you want to call it. But generally here in the West, and more specific in the United States, when you attend a masjid, you go into a community center, people arrive there simply because they believe in the oneness of Allah and believe in the finality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is the uniting factor that brings people into our masajid. That is the common denominator that brings people together, brings Muslims together here in the United States. And as Muslims who live in the United States, we must acknowledge that, that this is the common denominator. This is the universal factor that brings us all together. But because many of us or our parents or grandparents come from different lands, there are unique methods how we choose to practice Islam and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's different ways people and, and the, differences are ver the differences are various and we're not talking about differences here but in terms of your fiqh, in terms of you know other areas and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, the things that bring us together is that is the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which is why it's extremely important for us to be able to turn to the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to understand and find similes and examples through how which we can live our lives here as Muslims in the West or as Muslims in the United States. And the reason I mention this, and this is a very common message of mine, and the reason I mention this is because <clears throat> as Muslims we become very excited, we come together. But then that excitement and that unity that brings us together, we, we tend to begin to discuss our differences. And when we begin to discuss those differences, we're so hard and we're so concrete and not giving up some of the things that we come with, that we end up instead of creating friends and communities, we end up creating enemies. We end up breaking our communities. And that is a very real fact with Muslims in the United States. Right? People want to separate. And as individuals, <clears throat> I've, I've, I'm, I'm in my 30s, I've lived most of my life here, I was born in Europe. I grew up at a masjid in the United States. I went to the masjid, where at my masjid people still call me by my first name or they call me Beta. But the reality is that as I'm growing up and I guess my hairs are getting a little whiter than they were a few years ago, I'm coming to realize that I now have children that live in my house that are almost as tall as I am. And soon enough, 
I'm going to be living with other men in the same house. Right? It's just I'm the only man there right now. I'm going to have more men living in the same house. And as a Muslim, as one who is walking in this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on this journey where day in, day out in my community, I see friends and people passing away and coming close to their creator. As an individual who thrives and strives to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the legacy that I want to leave behind with my children? What is it that I want to leave behind with my children? Is it going to be the fact that, oh my child, we are Indian Muslims, your grandparents are Indian, so you should be a proud Indian? Or is it, oh my child, I come from a land where the Hanafi madhab is practiced and that's what I practice and you better practice that in order to be a successful Muslim. What is, honestly, what is it that I'm going to leave behind? What is, what is my challenge? What is it going to take? And this is a very simple question I ask myself as an individual who gets to travel a lot. What is it, what is it going to take on my part to ensure that when my children are in their 20s and 30s and they're out on a business trip somewhere, that they wait and they're in some hotel where no one knows who they are, where they are, that they are inspired to wake up in the morning at Fajr time and pray their Salat al-Fajr because they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because they're scared of Allah, but because they love Allah. That when they're going out to eat, they make conscious choices Right? They're making sure that they're not just eating junk food. They're not eating trash that fast food restaurants in this country serve. That they're making a conscious choice to, su to support local Muslim businesses no matter where they are. What is it going to take for, what, what, and what, what is it going to take on my part to pass that along to my children? It's a very, very simple question. Yet the answer can be a very difficult one. And I've come to realize, as a school teacher, it's not what you say that counts. It's not what you say that counts. It's what you do that counts. It's what you do as a parent that counts. And these children are observing. These children are looking at us day in, day out. And when I think of this, it's an inspiration because Again, going back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Qur'an. The Qur'an, we think that, oh, it's just the Qur'an, it's just Arabic, anyone can read the translation. There's some very deep messages in the Qur'an. Learn to not just recite the Qur'an, but learn to understand the Qur'an. And just because you've gone through a tafsir of the Qur'an once in your life, doesn't mean it's over. It's a continuous process. We need to continue that study. Right, you don't just go through the tafsir of the Qur'an one, seven, eight volumes and say, Alhamdulillah, I've studied the Qur'an and now I'm an expert and I can deliver a khutbah. It's not about that. It's not about being able to deliver. It's about being able to inspire oneself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You find the best example in that of the life of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. What did the Prophet do? The Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam taught, but the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam inspired. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his simple yet noble life inspired his companions. And his inspiration was so strong that his companions wanted to be like him. It wasn't just about hearing a message and conveying the message. There's a lot of things that we convey on a daily basis. We hear all kinds, there's all kinds of people that say all kinds of things. They may not be morally upright, but we still convey their message. There's great things that they've said. There's quotes of weird people. We still quote them because the quote happens to be a good quote and there's nothing wrong with that. But the Prophet ﷺ became an inspiration and it was such a great example that his companions wanted to be like him. They wanted to do what he did. They wanted to dress what he dressed like. They wanted to speak like what he spoke. That's why Imam Tirmidhi, and we've all known the, the, collect, the shama'il collected by Imam Tirmidhi, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, what he looked like, what he spoke like, what he walked like, what he talked like. 
how he met people, how he met children, how he met women, right? How he, how he talked to people. He didn't run away from people. He didn't scream at children, right? The simple things that people do. What, what will, when, you, when we pass away, how will people remember us? When I leave this dunya, how will people remember us? I was reading an Islamic Horizons magazine not too long ago, about a year or so ago. And I was reading at the end, you know, they have the obituaries of certain Muslim personalities in the country that have passed away. And there was one I remember within the first paragraph it was mentioned that people remember him to smile at everyone that he met. That's how people remembered him. And I was inspired from that day onwards to buy a box of chocolates and keep them in my office. And I have a habit that whenever young children come to the masjid, I give them candy. Not for them to come back to the masjid. But this is a memory that they will remember that as a child when I went to the masjid, there was someone who used to give me candy. Right? Just kindness. Kindness all around. Being that inspiration. Not just talking about the message. Going back to our children, not just talking about the message, but being that message. And what did the Prophet ﷺ do? The Prophet ﷺ, during his lifetime, even in the days of Mecca, and then even more during the days of Medina, the Prophet ﷺ had companions who became his ambassadors, and he sent these companions to the various different cities and towns. Right, when the first group of people came from Medina Munawwara, Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu an was part of them. What did he tell um, Mus'ab do? Mus'ab was a young man. He was a young man. What did he tell Mus'ab to do? I tell you, it's an amazing example. He tells Mus'ab, when you go back to your city, when you go back to your town, when you go back to Yathrib, lead your people in prayer. He made him a leader. He gave him something to do. And Mus'ab went back along with those 12, 13 people back to Medina Munawwara. Right? And their message was so strong that they came back next year with almost, almost 80 people. Right? Their allegiance. What did he do with Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu? Lama ba'atha Mu'adhan ila al-Yaman. When he sent Mu'adh to Yemen. What did he tell Mu'adh to do? Yassira wa la tu'assira. Oh Mu'adh, listen, make it easy for these people. Don't make it difficult. Bashira wa la tunaffira. Give them glad tidings, don't scare them. That was the Prophet's message to the people. But when they lived and they came, many of the companions, many of the companions, when they came to the Prophet wasallam, as you and I may imagine, they didn't live with him for years. Most of the companions at, at max lived with him for a few weeks. They spent a few weeks in his company sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when they left from there, they were inspired, they were changed. It wasn't just, there's two reasons. And I'm, I'm, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring these two things. It wasn't just the actions of the Prophet alayhi salam, Because a lot of people are good. But it was also the ibadah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah naturally drew people closer to him because he was close to Allah. Allah made it easy for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be so kind because he was close to Allah. He spent his nights, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil qum al-layla illa qalila nisfahu aw inqus minhu qalila. He spent portions of his night in remembrance of Allah. That's what gave him the inspiration, the divine power to live his days, despite the fact that those days were in poverty, despite the fact that those days were in difficulty. And Allah allowed him, Allah enabled him to become an inspiration. So as parents, right, we're talking about this unity, this one ummah, raising our children to be a part of the ummah. Right? As parents who are teaching them, it's Sunday schools are great, but they're not going to be enough. Telling our children to do good is good, but it's not going to be enough. In order for us to have children who continue to remain Muslims, we are going to have to become Muslims. We are going to have to become inspirations for them.
We are going to have to take the message of Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the message of the Prophet ﷺ to Mu'adh ibn Jabal to make things easy and not difficult. Right? Be kind with your children, be nice to your children. And see people say, a lot of parents, this is very common, a lot of parents will come to me and say, oh we're nice, we do everything for them. Yes, true. But sometimes there's no weight in our message. And there may be no weight in our message because our, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a parent is not where it should be at that point in time. As we get older, as everyone gets older, you know I mean, it's, it's a very simple thing, you've heard this a million times in the last few years, but when we all came to this country, we all know we had nothing or we had a little bit and you know, people grew and so on and so forth. I remember when I started working, I used to drive an old car, live in a two, in a one bedroom apartment. I mean, it's been 14 years, things have changed now, right? I'm, mashallah, I have a big house, I have two cars, we've got two kids and beautiful wife and life is good, alhamdulillah, say alhamdulillah. It's all good. But has my ibadah with Allah increased? Right? So when I used to pray Fajr and it used to take me 10 minutes, it should be taking me 15 minutes now. Right? Why, do not, why don't I wake up in the morning before, tah- before uh, the time for Fajr comes in for tahajjud? Why not? How come that hasn't come in yet? In terms of dunya, everything's coming in. It's all good. But in terms of my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how come that hasn't increased? Because our relationship with Allah is a direct factor through which our, 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 our interactions happen to be with people. That inspiration, that power, that awe that Allah puts in us through which people are affected. How come that hasn't increased? Right, so when we talk about this next generation, and when we talk about the ummah, and when we talk about the unity of the ummah, it comes through actions, it comes through example, yet it also comes through our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I tell you, last night I, I almost had an, as I was boarding the flight, I, I just had this revelation. And it was a very tough revelation. Uh, my father is, is, mashallah, blessed, healthy, he's in his late 60s, been tr- all he does is travel ever since he retired at the age of 45. He's a very content man, doesn't have a lot of money, but very content. He retired at the age of 45, he's been on, all he does is travel to see friends and family. Six weeks, seven weeks ago in Medina Munawwara, he fell down and fractured his femur. He's been bedridden for six weeks. For me to see my own father bedridden, mind-blowing. Right? One of his very close friends last Thursday, I spoke to one of his very close friends last Wednesday night after his cataract surgery. I found out two days later that on Thursday and Friday, he had two back-to-back um, strokes. Right? I, went and see, I went and saw him at the hospital on Monday and the rehab home on Tuesday. As I'm boarding the flight yesterday, another very dear friend of my father's calls me and says, look, I know your father is ill. I, I'll let you choose when is, is the right time and when is the right method to break the news to him. But um, my cancer has come back and it's pretty strong right now. And I just kind of, and this was right, because he said, oh, there's a lot of background noise. Is everything okay? I said, I'm getting ready to board the flight. So he goes, okay, I'll keep my message short. And we hung up. It just dawned on me that life, every, you know, these are amazing people. These are people who I've known for 35 years of my life. And it's, they're getting old and things are changing for them. And mashallah, I'm, I ask myself that where do I want to be as a Muslim, as a parent, as a community member, as a leader in 30, 35 years from now if I make it that far? Right? I, need, I need to become that example. And in order to become an example, I also need to increase my worship and ibadah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are two things that go hand in hand. I, I need to become a successful Muslim, one who people look up to, one who the community, not just the Muslim community, the community at large respects that I have, you know, there's, I can convey my message to the people. Yet at the same time, at the same time, I need to build this relationship and bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The bare minimum is great, but the bare minimum won't suffice. And I need to, I need to connect my children, not with an ethnicity, not with an ideology, not with certain kinds of people, but I need to connect my children to Allah. That's my challenge. 
right? Dr. Ridha Bashir, an amazing author on children's books and social. But, you know, he, I, I was with him not too long ago and he said, we need to connect our children to Allah. For them to be conscious of Allah, for them to not necessarily fear, but for them to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. بارك الله بارك الله لنا ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعنا وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم إنه تعالى جواد كريم ملك بر الرؤوف الرحيم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كلامه المجيد والفرقان الحميد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وصل على المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذريته قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أرحم أمتي بأمتي أبو بكر وأشدهم في أمر الله عمر وأصدقهم حياء عثمان وأقضاهم علي وفاطمة سيدة نساء أهل الجنة والحسن والحسين سيدا شباب أهل الجنة وحمزة أسد الله وأسد رسوله رضوان الله تعالى عليهم أجمعين اللهم اغفر للعباس وولده مغفرة ظاهرة وباطنة لا تغادر ذنبا الله الله في أصحابي لا تتخذوهم غرضا من بعدي فمن أحبهم فبحبي أحبهم ومن أبغضهم فببغضي أبغضهم وخير القرون قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم اللهم أيد الإسلام وأنصاره وأذل للشرك وأشراره اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى واجعل آخرتنا خيرا من الأولى اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم واجعلنا منهم واخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا معهم تعادلوا يا عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروني ولا تكفرون أقيم الصلاة